ਸਲਾਮੁਅਲੈਕੁਮ long said my very well learned colleague who happens to be miss haja sati i happen to be shahzad hasan khan and to my surprise as soon as i stepped outside my house today <laughs> i could feel that the wind was a little colder and it was because of the fact that it was raining last night ladies and gentlemen over here in islamabad and islamabad looks magnificent but first things first hello haja how are you doing today assalam alaikum jazakallah khair thank you so much introducing for introducing me shahzad so i think there's a treat due uh, by you so uh, after we are done with the show why not go for the pakoras but yes the temperatures have dropped significantly and uh, i do feel that this is a pre monsoon and it's very early because it's in the may uh, because as soon as the rain or the breeze stops you can feel a very sweat or humidity in true, the air true. but uh, i think early in the morning at 5 or 5:30 pm uh, we had this very significant showers and as we always maintain islamabad looks beautiful clean and green after a fresh shower true. Uh, and you can enjoy the beauty of it the cleanliness on the roads and the magnificent trees that are blowing and especially when they are freshly showered uh, so shazad we were going through our pre program <laughs> preparations and we came across a very interesting news um, <laughs> especially for those who have the iphone so i yeah. don't have an iphone Or but who my, have a spouse uh, uh, <laughs> my brother here <laughs> so my brother here he has an iphone so <laughs> it's a very interesting news for the iphone users that a new feature they will be able to replicate the user's voice for 15 minutes uh, so you will be soon able to hear uh, that iphone reproducing your own voice that for the 15 years so um, shazad have you thought of the better usage how to productively obviously, use this feature <laughs> obviously there's so many better uses out okay. there and it's the, so the number one the, okay. the reason why i said that you know that you know people who actually have spouses you know they'll be very <laughs> thrilled with this feature <laughs> So imagine every time you are away out of the town you know somewhere working and your wife calls you up and you are not able to give her that the uh, that time which she actually kind of demands from you yes. all you need to do is turn on the feature and let the phone talk on its own i, I think it can be pre recorded to as well and imagine that your spouse won't even have any idea whether it's you or not but ladies and gentlemen i think that the world's getting crazier out there there's yes. so many new technologies which have been coming out what other added benefits do you see that this feature will provide to uh, i mean i mean it's risky so imagine yes. if your yes, cell phone can actually produce the same vocal cords you mm. produce mm. ladies and gentlemen imagine that that cell phone can actually be used anywhere all your data is in your icloud it can be dangerous too and and we've certainly seen the news where the icloud was hacked because there was a myth around the cloud uh, computing storage that it's never hacked so it's very safe and uh, apple invested a lot in the um, this safety protocols but shazad you're very right in pointing it out that um, people have misused this feature a lot so i was listening to this news that where artificial intelligence generated deep voice was used to extract the bank details yeah. and the uh, atm password cards or what not from a user Um, and then she came to know that it was not an in person but there was a um, artificial intelligence and she was conned out of it and that's good thing that she had an insurance in some western yeah. countries um, but obviously we are very concerned about these deep fakes either these are videos or they are uh, audios coming out and obviously with humans we have the penalty for them but for artificial intelligence what i don't know who do to punish in the first place but obviously right? the creator of artificial intelligence <laughs> once you go to the creator of artificial yes. intelligence he'll be like you know what's my fault I gave it to you to yes. so that you can use it for your benefit but having said so okay. so imagine we live in a country where almost i think 50 to 60000 phones are stolen every year i mean the figure might be too low yes. but obviously we do have a problem where a lot of cell phones do get stolen yes. i mean just uh, today my uh, makeup artist was telling me that his phone got stolen oh, and oh that ptv God. actually provides them with a facility that they can actually lease phone lcd and anything Wonderful. so so he got a new phone that's how i got to know So imagine if somebody has got your phone now and yes. they can use that same application yes. produce your voice call somebody ask for some ransom yes. that can be very dangerous that's, imagine calling somebody true. else you know one of your friends or spouses where it's not you and it will be so hard yes. for people to believe and understand yes. that okay yaar kasam se main nahi tha bhai main to main keh raha hu it wasn't me <laughs> but no people are not going to understand and god forbid yes. unfortunately if that's how it's going to be yes. we might see an increase in divorce we might see an increase in 
a lot of crimes as well and where a lot of people who have not committed a crime might be ending up behind the bars, unfortunately. I think that's me overthinking. I think, uh, yes, you might be overthinking, but we certainly don't know. We will see in the future how the things roll out, uh, if the causes of divorce is the artificial intelligence or not. Uh, or but no intelligence at all. Or no, yeah, or human intelligence, yeah. or human over-intelligence. <laughs> or death I really of human intelligence. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, or maybe, you know, uh, over-intelligence, what, what do we call it? Um, so, uh, rolling back to our topic, which is related to about marital lives, the laws related to it, uh, and how um, do uh, what sort of legal framework is available? And as far as I know, especially in the Nikah Nama, which is also an Islamic percept because it has a lot of um, facilities and rights which are given to women. But because of the dearth of information or awareness surrounding that Nikah Nama, because people don't read that much into mm. it, right? Uh, so they have given this delegated this authority to some um, third person who is usually, um, uh, uh, I mean, a chachu or a mamu or a pupa. Yeah, or uh, maybe more who is who has no idea that, about it. Yes, who is reading that uh, the Nikah Nama incantations, uh, Quranic verses, and, and they simply cross a lot of boxes, uh, which gives you a lot of rights as a woman, right? And people don't utilize that. Uh, and how many rights of the men are safeguarded in that very uh, sacred marital uh, bliss? Um, yes, matrimonial bliss. So we are going to talk about the laws which governs the laws of marriage and obviously the divorce and the maintenance laws and whatnot. Uh, so we're very glad that we have been joined by Ms. Fatma Barsh, who happens to be a lawyer. Assalamu alaikum and thank you so much for coming to our show. Thank you so much for inviting me in your program. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us. It's wonderful to have you over here alongside uh, Ms. Fatma. We're very lucky that we've actually been joined by somebody who happens to be barrister, Humayun Safraz, Chatta Saab, lawyer, Supreme Court. Hello, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Alaykum. How are you? I'm good. So thank you so much for joining us. Wonderful to have you over here. So first things first, let me ask you both. It's a personal yeah. question. Sir, are you married, sir? Uh, it's difficult to answer. It's actually. difficult to answer. It's complicated. Yeah. It's perfectly all right. Ms. Hope Fatma. you understand. Yeah, yeah, we, we do <laughs> understand. We do understand. But before we start in uh, such a conversation where we are about to ask about family laws and you know how the marriage really needs to be in place, mm -hmm. it's, it's certainly the sole purpose to ask this question is that this very institution of marriage, ladies and gentlemen, is very well celebrated yes. uh, in our every household and that's how it should be. So the sole purpose we are discussing it is that God forbid if there's somebody who might not even be aware of all of these laws which do exist. So ladies yes. and gentlemen, they can seek help and mm -hmm. they can get professional help as well. So I'm going to move on to Barista Saab first up. Barista Saab, now to get started, obviously the first problem, first we'll discuss marriage and then we'll move on towards divorce. So now the first issue over here is that a lot of people talk about the legal age of getting married. Now, if we are to talk about it, you know, some people say that 18 plus probably, but as per law, what do you think is the legal marriage, uh, legal age to get married for a boy and for a girl? Sir, it, uh, as far if you talk about Pakistan, it varies from province to province. Okay, uh, It is a provincial subject. Some provinces have made it to 16, some have made it to 18. Okay. So you can take it to 18 actually. That is mostly considered the legal age to get married. So which provinces Though, allow you to get married at uh, 16? Sir, if you talk about, uh, I can't tell you exactly, okay. but I think Sindh has made it to 18. Hmm. Okay. So recently uh, they legislated about it. Okay. Uh, Punjab has it around 16 for oh. girls. So okay. mostly it is about girls actually. And what about boys? So, you know, if I'm 12 years old and you know I want to get married, I can get married? That is not very much discussed in Pakistan because I think uh, parents are very conscious about uh, their uh, uh, male children. So. Uh, that hasn't been discussed much uh, in the legis uh, by the legislators. But as far as women are concerned, I think that is the uh, very problematic area and uh, needed their attention. And uh, I think uh, laws have been made to help women. But uh, the real problem is the mindset hmm. uh, or culture. We'll come back towards mindset and culture. Let's get the laws out there for our people as well. Because those so are c yeah. closely related. Exactly. So 16 and 18 depends on which province you are in. And mm -hmm. you know, if you are, you want to get married to somebody who's 16, look out for the province but, but, who, but which actually allows you to get married at 16. But, but Shazad, we've seen instances, especially if you talk about the Islamic law or the Islamic culture in a particular place. Uh, and if we analyze the generations of our nana, dad or grandparents, so you will see that there was this trend of getting married early, right? Uh, so I think now in the 21st century, I the have things have that trend. evolved. Uh -huh. So you got married I got at 12? married at 23. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, not 20s, like in whenever they get the adolescent stage, the puberty stage, so they used to get married like 30. Yeah. 
yeah. 14 yeah. or 15. Yeah. You know, we have seen that trend. Uh, and in Islamically, you've seen that uh, that really happened. Uh, but what if uh, the Islamic law is in contravention with the, the constitution uh, or, or the legalities of that particular area? So which law to follow? Because there's also provision in the constitution that no law will be made which is in the contravention of Islam, right? Well, uh, if you look at the Sharia court judgments, yeah. those are very much, uh, uh, I would say, uh, validate uh, about the age which has been put by the Islamic jurisprudence. Okay. Okay. Uh, I was reading a judgment where a uh, girl's age was about 13 years hmm. and the Sharia court held that it is a valid nikah. Hmm. Exactly. And it might have other legal consequences, right. but as far as Islamic jurisprudence yes. is, con uh, is yes. concerned, it is a valid nikah. And obviously, you know, if we are to look at Prophet's life, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life, we do get an example yeah. of that too as well. But Ms. Fatma, now let me move on to you. So obviously, mm. we have spoken about the girl child and what the legal age will be. Now let's talk about men, because men at times can be really uh, cunning. And, you know, so at times just in order to get married, you mm. know, they might hide their um, age as well. So imagine that, you know, if I am entering into nikah with somebody and I am 36 years old and I tell them that I'm 26 years old and they and they do the nikah or whatever the ceremonies was, whatever ceremonies were supposed to be held, they are held. So my nikah is going to stand valid once they, you know, my nikah number is going to go to the union council and they will check my ID card and they'll be like, oh, you know, uh, is it a mistake or was it by an intention? So what's going to happen then? You know, at the time of registration of marriage, it is mandatory to uh, provide your CNIC, which is uh, like uh, given to you by the government of Pakistan. But I'm sorry, you know, if you pay charges no, or to somebody, he will write whatever no, if you know, tell him. Uh, you know, if you check the Nikah Nama, there is mandatory provision to write your uh, like uh, ID card number. And even if you are not Pakistani, then you have to provide your passport copy, even if, like uh, if, you are, if you are a foreigner or you are coming from some other country. So you have to provide your ID card or your passport. Or And in both these documents, your uh, date of birth is also always mentioned. So it's the uh, like responsibility of the person who is conducting Nikah that he has to check the uh, accurate information with the person is providing but in case if you think that your husband had which usually in this case is imam masjid no it's the registrar it's the okay. nikah hua, which is uh, like appointed by the uh, union council or okay. local government so they are the authorized authorized person to conduct nikah uh, like uh, you know ca ca uh, marriage is a contract between two persons yes. so uh, our two state families, rather. <laughs> Our state, on paper, it's between two. Yeah, it, you know, it's like a, you are accepting, uh, you are giving an offer to somebody. Like I want to do nikah with you, and the other person accepting your offer. Mm -hmm. So there are always some terms and conditions, and there is also some consideration which is in the form of haq mm -hmm. So Islamically, and as per the law of uh, Pakistan, it is considered as the contract. So if somebody is uh, like uh, giving wrong information, of course you can sue them. Uh, for example, they are uh, providing wrong information, so it falls under the category of fraud. But the nikah will stand valid yes it will because you know you are the so nikah then what kind of punishment do you think as per the law the gentleman is going to get just because you know he was fraudulent he didn't write the uh, perfect age mm -hmm. or probably you know he kept everybody else out of his secret you know the entire family of the bride for example so what punishment can he be given by you the know law? these type of cases are very rare like when Chalo when parties are, are, yeah when parties are making objection over the age thing the main thing is uh, that when person hide his previous marriages or uh, his uh, children th there are number of cases yeah. in which person show them that i am single person i am not previ yes. previously previously yes. married yeah. so in that case th it's a serious crime your uh, your nikah will stand same yeah. it will not going to be nullified but by that's the court why that, that the sole reason why i'm discussing it is that you know that's how people take advantage of it because they do know that the nikah is going to stand valid so even after they're going to figure out that okay you know i was married earlier i had children earlier what difference do you think it's going to make no difference no then you have option to uh, file a case for dissolution of marriage on okay. the basis of fraud like the, that person has concealed his previous marriages uh, from you uh, but the main thing is that when you are going to marry someone, it's your responsibility to okay. do some investigation. Yes. As I am yes. telling you, it's <laughs> <laughs> then you have to face uh, consequences. Then you yeah. can't blame the yes. government. Of course, then the onus is yeah. on the other party yes. to, to yes. dig out whatever it is. Yes. But uh, obviously, socially, it's not always, it's a very laborious task and socially you don't have enough tools to find out the True. background about the other person. So, Hamayu Saab, moving back to you. Uh, so, this you talked about the mindsets and the specific culture which is prevailing in Pakistan. So we have seen that there are instances um, in order to protect the properties, lands, a lot of women are married uh, to, I mean, 
very funny things, for example, like trees or whatnot, uh, in order to protect uh, their properties and lands. So if someone, is it legally, uh, I mean, in legality, what sort of standing does it, this marriage have? And if some woman wants to protect herself from this farsity, I would call it. Um, so what options does she have in the laws, in Islamic laws too, and in the constitution of Pakistan? It's absolutely uh, not allowed in Islam, of uh, such kind of marriages. And though uh, it is a very rare word, uh, as far as nikah is concerned, but these nikahs are void ab initio. Okay. It means that this just hadn't happened actually. Okay. okay. It would be like that. Okay. The other case, like you were discussing with Fatima, mm. uh, where uh, uh, a, a person defrauded the, his partner or her partner not in, in, right in either circumstance. Whatever, yeah, the circumstances. In that case, the nikah would not be void ab initio because there are many repercussions to that. They might have children by that time. Okay. By the time they by get the to know each other, to figure out that yeah, so for, for that matter, the nikah would be valid, okay. but he or she would have option to go to the court or either go to the uh, authorities like police that this person has. Uh, but that option is always going to be valid. Now, you, though, you know, God forbid, you know, even if you you were fraudulent, even if you weren't fraudulent, whether you lied or not, you know, if one decides that they do not want to live with us, yes. obviously they can go any time. But very quickly before we move on to divorce laws as well, because Pakistan is home to minorities as well, you know, yeah. for example, Christians, for example, Sikhs, for example, Hindus. Mm. So does the same law apply on, on them as well or is it as per their religion tells them to? Uh, no, no, they, those laws are different. Okay. They have their own civil laws okay. which uh, dealt their marriages according to their own religions and customs. Okay. And, and what about the inter-religious marriages? I mean, yeah. uh, so we've seen the instances in Islam where the marriage with Ahl al-Kitab, Ahl al-Kitab is yeah. valid, that, that, right? That Ahl al-Kitab is, is a different instance, but otherwise out of religion marriage is not acceptable in okay. Islam. Okay. Okay. So, so Ahl al-Kitab uh, that is written in Quran. Yes. So that is valid too because you know number of people who are who married to okay. a number of women, mostly women. Yes. Yes. Uh, out of uh, their country, like uh, they they married to someone from USA, from England. So True. there are multiple instances of that. But mm. in Pakistan, you you. It is very difficult to find such cases. There might be some instances in Karachi or the metropolitan cities, but traditionally, oh, oh, society does not allow that beyond everything else. And we haven't seen ma many examples over here. Uh, so it is difficult to talk about such instances. Okay, okay, wonderful. Because we do not have examples. Uh, Presidents so don't past. have precedent, so exactly. So okay, there is okay. no precedence. Okay. Now, now, uh, rather than talking about how to get the marriage certificate, let's just mm -hmm. ignore that as well because we short on time. <laughs> let's come back to divorce now. Now. For example, you've lived for um, two years, three years, four years for as long as you, you would have wanted and then now all of a sudden things are not getting through. Do you think there will be somebody talking about that, okay, you know, some chachu uncle or papa is going to come in for a resolution? Is that the first place? Or do you think that the first place would be to go uh, get a lawyer for yourself and just file a case? Or what's going to happen now? Uh, it's not mandatory requirement to involve your family in, uh, like in your marriage matters. Uh, and, and we have to differentiate in between Divorce talaq and then yes. uh, divorce khula as well. Yes, yes these, uh, these are different things. Talaq is a separate thing and khula is a separate thing and there are different laws for them. Okay. So uh, if we talk about like is it mandatory to involve your family, it's your personal choice. Nobody can compel you or even court can't compel you like to involve your family members in that matter because it's between husband and wife. No other third person is okay. allowed to intervene between them. So in case if uh, a woman, uh, like first talk about a woman, if she is facing some problem in her uh, marriage and she is thinking that she wants to uh, take khula, yeah. so uh, the khula is always granted by the judicial officer, which is called as judge. So family judge, uh, the family court has the absolute jurisdiction to deal with such matters and uh, a female has to approach a, a family court by filing a petition for khula. So they are different. Uh, in what khula. are the legal grounds to file a khula or divorce? You know, for khula, even if women say that I don't want to live with my husband, it's sufficient. What you the <laughs> <laughs> but they don't approach court on daily basis. That, that would suffice for that matter. Yeah, but, but you know, I think I even heard you know, it khula, today khula, the khula is I, no I joke. Don't live you know, you. Khula is no joke because uh, we we don't even I'm a lawyer, but I don't know uh, what was the actual problem, what was her suffering. So we we can't uh, like understand. I can assure you, you know, everything is fine at my place. But every morning she's going to wake up, she'll tell me. Yeah, man, it was. Yeah, I mean, this is your side of the story. Yeah, yeah. yeah her side it's of the story. 
Holy Prophet asked uh, her, uh, do you agree to return the haq mahif which was given to you by your husband? And she said, okay, I, I am willing to return it. And at that time, their khula was pronounced. So this is the concept because, you know, Islam can't of compel course. a woman to live with a man with whom she is not and happy. And there is another example as well. So there was this uh, baby girl, you know, her parents passed away. And that this is this actually comes from the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you know, so the guardian was her uncle and her uncle got her married to somebody and she didn't like it. She yes. went to Prophet Muhammad yes. Sallallahu yes. Alaihi Wasallam. Yes. They got a divorce and then Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got, got her married to a person she liked who wasn't exactly. even well off in a status, or in a worldly you know, status as this well. This is the real Islam, but Hazrat in, bin Haris. you know, this yeah. is the real, this, this is the real Islam, but in Pakistan we have seen that even in this but 21st the, the century the legal grounds let's talk yeah, about the legal grounds. yeah i am going to talk about the legal grounds you know in uh, in this 21st century <laughs> i mean that's not a legal ground i mean that, that I, is I, actually, mean, I mean in islam it is, is, so it's it is the concept islam, it is you, know, what you know what i'm telling you you know what i'm telling you islam is very liberal very progressive like, how would you know if your wife is lying or not you know the, i mean how would you know if she's not a temperamental, how would you know if she's not angry you know, with you then, or something? Then like that, you so? have to discuss before getting okay. married to her whether she likes you or not. You have to discuss <laughs> things with her. So Nobody uh, talking, allows us to no, discuss so, before so marriage. Talking about, so, oh, talking about, which are <laughs> 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 so talking about. Nobody allows us to discuss, right? Obviously, you know, I, I never had. A, this is what I'm going I've to tell you. I've never spoken to my wife you know, before my marriage. You know, that's how it was. You know, this, but is, I think this is my point. This is my point. Even in 21st century, our women or even men are not allowed to marry as the as per their choices. But even if you talk about Islam, you know, I always quote this thing. The first marriage of Islam was uh, of uh, Hazrat Khadija. Hazrat and it's, it's an example for everyone. Like a woman is approaching someone hmm. like on the basis of his professional dealings and she is very impressed with, with yeah. him. And I so she's want like, this to happen to me as well. You know, somebody comes to me and be like, <laughs> I'll so, think about it and I'll let you know. You know, even I think I think I think he certainly wants to get kicked out from the house the way he is tweaking the laws Toma. in his way. Toma <laughs> but but uh, Chatta Saab coming to you. Uh, so obviously, like Shazad was alluding to in our pre-program discussions, and he raised a wonderful point about a uh, lot of poor people, um, marginalized people who do not have enough resources to approach the court, and especially divorce process is very laborious. Uh, and we see in the joint family. System. We do have disputes. I mean, on every other day there are things happening. Um, so, what does the law in the Constitution of Pakistan offer to protect such kind of segments? Uh, because I was reading the examples of the ADR centers, alternative dispute resolution. Obviously, they're not replicated in the entire country. They are in some specific places. Do you think the ADR help uh, poor pay people, uh, marginalized segments, or labor class who do not have enough resources to hire the lawyers, um, which is obviously a very demanding job? At, at times. So, so uh, what does the protection offer by the Constitution? Well, that is the very real problem you are, uh, I think people are facing it every other day. Hmm. True. Uh, you have to buy uh, justice uh, in our yes. system. Yes. Uh, though there are uh, uh, many lawyers who offer services, but uh, th I think that is actually not sufficient. Yes. Yes. So people face it every other day. Of course. Uh, they face it in criminal justice system. Mm. They face in civil matters. Mm. So that is the real problem. I think that is the area uh, where our justi justice system needs to be uh, to be reformed mm. for mm. that matter. Uh, so that everyone who is in lack of resources mm. uh, would be able to get justice. Exactly. And in addition to that, you know, let's talk about the entire process. You know, how long will it take? And then. Unfortunately, where you've actually kind of directed in the right direction, there there needs to be a lot of reforms within our judicial system. I think that there needs to be a lot of reforms within the personalities of the lawyers too. 
because I've seen that a lot of lawyers, what they do is that they extend the period just in order so that they can get paid more as well. And yes. that's something which and un, a, a person who's already going through a divorce comes from a very humble background, cannot yes. afford it already. And the lawyer keeps on putting in another date just because, you know, so that he or she can actually earn a good amount of money from somebody who's already in a terrible crisis. So how long do you think that the process needs to take effectively and what can actually cause it to be uh, a, a little longer than the normal process time? What grounds can that Well, be? that is very unfortunate. Mm. Uh, it happens in our society in uh, multiple roles, either as a lawyer or the case might be different. Okay. There are instances where cl client wants you to delay the case. Okay. Mostly these instances happen on the uh, premise of their clients. All right. they just want to scare their spouse, spouse you know, or just to linger they it want on, to linger it on that difficult time. Yeah. They might get, uh, let's say, resolve, resolve the, they might re reconcile. reconcile. Yes. The, uh, people do face these problems. Mm. So I think th th uh, th these uh, problems, uh, let's say, if I talk about uh, family laws or family courts, they are very, I would say, uh, time, time efficient. They don't waste your time. Hmm. Uh, usually, if a lawyer is uh, uh, is well intentioned, he can get resolve that matter. I, I would say in three to six months. Hmm. All right. Yeah. So every time you're going to go to a family court, uh, the decision is going to be a divorce, or do you think it can be a reconciliation as well? Now, first, the judge would ask you to for the reconciliation okay. that is provided in the law. Okay. And if uh, the husband and wife they say uh, that uh, that is not possible, then uh, they will go for uh, the divorce or the hula proceedings. All right. well, wonderful. So very quickly towards the end, okay. do you think it's the judge who will then announce that God forbid that you're divorced now or then eventually it will be the husband saying main talaq deta hon, talaq deta hon, talaq deta hon, something of that sort. Do you think that the order will come from the court then? Only then the divorce will be finalized or do you think that the married couple will have to do the religious norms, whatever we have over here. If it's talaq, it's yeah. like it's pronounced by the husband, then... Uh, so, judge, whatever you say, there's no need. No, no, if it's talaq, then you don't have to approach the court. You have to approach union counsel by okay. uh, like uh, giving in writing notice, like you are going to divorce your wife. So, union counsel, after receiving the notice, give three notices to the both parties. It's three, uh, like three months, 90 days mandatory uh, no. procedure. So, in these 90 days, do you have option to... Husband, because husband is pronouncing the divorce, he has the option for reconciliation. Okay. Nobody can force the husband like, uh, like he has to... Uh, uh, reconcile with his wife it's totally his discretion whether he wants to proceed with the marriage or not so after uh, passage of 90 days divorce become effective uh, like if, uh, if it is given by the husband so in case of husband it's the union counsel which gives the effectiveness of divorce certificate exactly. it's called divorce certificate and in case if woman has approached the court by filing a khula case in the court, then it's the court which pronounced the khula decree because uh, khula is the power which is given to the judicial officer, which is judge. So khula is always pronounced by the judge and after uh, hearing of the case, so judge give a final verdict or it's called judgment in Pakistan. Yeah. So in that judgment, it is uh, written that the khula has been pronounced or khula has been granted and, to the wife. And one last thing and that is that there's been a lot of debate around, you know, that you, you said met talaq deta once or you met Talaq 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 twice, or yeah, triple yeah. talaq, you know, mm -hmm. so, so how does the rule You know, off? it's very complicated thing. Uh, religion comes in that thing. But uh, if we talk about law, because, you know, our marriage is registered as per the law of Pakistan, which is Muslim Family Law Ordinance 1961. And uh, divorce is also dealt in that uh, act of law as well. So in that case, even husband in pr is pronouncing divorce by, uh, like, uh, his words or oral so then he has to give notice to the union council but there are number of cases in which husband uh, like denied that i have not pronounced the divorce to my wife yeah. in that case you uh, wife is left with only one op option that she has to approach the court but in yeah. case if husband is pronouncing uh, divorce then he has to uh, immediately uh, inform union the union council, council yeah. that i am giving wonderful to noted and thank you so much thank for being so with us w to be in conversation so with you and for everybody who's out there ladies and gentlemen this entire segment was for people yeah. who unfortunately cannot bear the expenses and are living a life 
which they call hell, unfortunately. Otherwise, for me, yes. I think as a person, marriage is an institution, ladies and gentlemen, yes. which is actually the most beautiful. And You're sacred. going to have a companion for the rest of your life and beautiful children. So please make yes. sure that the marriages need to stay intact, yes. even if it's not, not for yourself, for your kids as well. We're heading out towards a short break. Once you guys will come back, there's somebody we want you to see because that lady is actually looking after a lot of kids. Good morning. Welcome back and before going on to the break, my wonderful colleague here alluded to the fact that there are some people who are looking after a marginalized segment and that too, uh, the segment of the children because children, I think, uh, especially when they're in the age of infancy or they're moving toward the adolescence, they need a lot of guidance and I think education is one thing that can uplift them uh, spiritually, materially and whatnot, right? Uh, and in so recent times, Hajra, we have seen that you know how important education yes, is for yes, our future yes. generations, God forbid, yes. and uh, which is why today, ladies and gentlemen, we are actually going to share an exemplary, inspirational, full of inspiration, uh, a story of a lady who's actually taken 800 children Wonderful. from slums to schools and making sure that she's going to educate them. And that's not it. We'll talk more about it as well. But we're very lucky, ladies and gentlemen, that we've been actually, uh, we will be talking to somebody. And how did they do that in the first place, yes. number one? And that too, at such a younger age that you have taken 800 students out of slums, taking them yes. to study, making sure that they're not going to study the conventional way. Yes. But it may, and, and she actually made sure that they're going to study and a syllabi, which is going to be prepare them for the future or the requirements yes. of the future. Yes, and Shazad, thank you so much for mentioning that because I believe that it is also a wonderful job uh, and, and a difficult job, I would say, doing that uh, because it requires a lot of convincing with the parents and usually a lot of parents we have seen that they're not ready to send their children to or mm. kids to the school, school because uh, they believe that they can earn a lot of money while working there, True. right? True. Uh, and you need to have an entire change in the mindset in order to to convince those parents to let their kids uh, to go to the schools in order to acquire the education and that is a more long term longer term planning but unfortunately some people don't understand that and that is why they make sure that their kids either they are working as a laborer somewhere or maybe uh, doing the how domestic chores and whatnot right so we are very glad that we have been joined by Dr. Hifza Khan she happens to be a philanthropist and organization's name is Saez Khudai Zul Jalal so assalamu alaikum and thank you so much for coming so, so we are really inspired by your story and like I mentioned, it's a, a not an easy job convincing a lot of people, especially those coming from the slum areas, uh, to go to the schools because they have other shorter term objectives contributing towards the um, household income and whatnot. So uh, what inspired you towards this job and uh, what are the, some of the challenges? Do you agree with this assertion? Yeah, um, during my university life, I just went to the slums of Lahore to see how they are living because uh, since my childhood, uh, my parents used to say we, we shouldn't go to uh, meet these children. And, you know, uh, they are beggars and they are like this, we, we shouldn't talk to them, uh, we shouldn't even uh, meet them. So uh, it was uh, Ramadan seven years ago. And I just went to slums to see uh, what's the condition. So when, when I went there... And w which particular slum you're focused Lahore on? Lahore slums. Lahore it's slums. a subsidiary area. Okay. So when I went there, uh, like their house were broken uh, because of rain maybe uh, some days ago. So I asked the children, your, your house is broken now, so what would you do now? How would you live? So they said, uh, we will make it again. They were uh, smiling. So I realized they, they don't have water, they don't have food, they don't have proper housing, nothing. But uh, they are still not... Uh, you know claiming like we we have nothing they're, they're happy so I I decided I should give them two or three months to them because uh, I had uh, so there was this idea of container based school I think initially right I no, I actually started from a camp okay I borrowed 11,000 from someone to uh, make a camp it was made of fabric wow. and I went there right after Eid I I bought uh, stationery bags 30 stationery bags from Urdu Bazaar and when I went there it was my first day and 50 students came Wow. Wonderful. And parents were uh, coming with their children and said, teacher, please give uh, admission to our, our children. 
so that was amazing for me i said okay uh, i have uh, let's start it so uh, i got volunteers from my university and we started teaching them for a month and then two months uh, two months so uh, then uh, i had to go back to university life so then i so from 50 it grew to 100 from 100 to 200 and then 800. when did the containers come in a uh, continuous later later yeah four years later okay. so it was a struggle of four year in the camp so you stayed in the camp every single day you were giving them time the number of students was increasing yeah. so you had to get the most stationery and you you were gathering money from people or from your pocket you know so you've never asked those children to pay you anything right yeah, i remember i i used to take three chingtis to go to the slums Wow! <laughs> Just to save money. So he had to actually book three rickshaws to kind of make yes. it to the slums yes. as well because there was so much luggage as well, bags, books, copies, and then obviously eventually students start to help as well, and and it's wonderful. So when was the time when you thought that okay now it, it's about time that we form an NGO and I'm going to name it Saya Khuda Isul Jalal? Well, when I faced uh, started facing criticism from the society. Uh, from what sort of criticism were you facing? But, but people used to say they are beggars. Uh, they they will remain like this. I'm wasting my time. Right. Why am I doing this? I can do my own work. I can earn money, and you know uh, go for all the stuff uh, mm. that everybody else wants. Yeah, that's what parents say most of the time. Yeah. बेटा तुम्हें पढ़ाई लिखाई आप तो मारे पैसे भी जाएगे. Parents, teachers, even friends, they all left me because uh, wh why I'm going there. True. And especially from the medical school, because there's a lot of investment involved True. usually in the self-finance sector. Uh, so, uh, so we have seen that. And so, how was the response of that particular community? And your journey is uh, taking those kids from the slums and putting it into the school, right? Um, so, the school that you are mentioning was it that makeshift camp, or, or were you uh, putting them in some other schools? Because obviously, when you are a student, uh, I mean, you've also tend towards your studies and look after that. And obviously, it's difficult task juggling between. the two uh, one moral responsibility another which is your academic responsibility yeah. and then a lot of people actually create challenges for you too you know for example yes. so wherever your camp was you know people might have shown up that you know bb please uh, do not teach students over here kindly please move to that side or this side as well so how did you come across all of that obviously i didn't have investment uh, for for their proper schooling so after giving them 6 months training i took uh, five students to a private school Uh, and they cleared the test and at the time of admission some other parents were also there for uh, their children's admission wow. and they said to the principal if a slum child will uh, get admission in this school we will not enroll our uh, children in the school That's the principal God. refused me so that was the time when i realized i have to do it on my own so from the fabric camp i uh, turned into a bamboo based camp Wow. So we we took bamboos and soil and all the stuff and, and uh, flexes and we made a proper hut. I hired a teacher and a kari for them and then we started giving them on uh, the floor. And I I remember we faced forty seven degrees Celsius there. Oh my God! It it you know it actually In kind oven, of yeah. feels like you know a, a film story narration as well and you've done it, mashallah. And mashallah. you know so obviously you're a source of inspiration while we. talking about it as well you know you wanted them to have modern education so imagine that you've taken five of your children whom you were educating previously to a private school yeah. to attend their admission exam and all five of them passed so imagine yeah. that you were teaching them something very Wonderful. rightfully you know you're teaching methods were on point as well so now there was a time when you faced so many challenges that you realized that you have to do it on your own so you went on to babu camp and what not and you faced all those challenges and the students kept on pouring in which meant that the family or the parents of the yes. people who were living in slums certainly yes. wanted their kids to be educated yeah. and Obviously. it's it's wonderful so now there was this bigger responsibility on you now yeah. from from bamboo camps to you wanted a place where they can come study be comfortable and so that they have a better future how did you go about that then there comes a, a turning point in my life i got graduated from the university 2 years ago and uh, i i had team of 300 volunteers wow i made team So when I got graduated, everybody left. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was so all, all alone. So all three hundred. So that means the two hundred and ninety-nine people left. It was only you there. It, it was only me. And then uh, COVID uh, comes, Changing and I, uh, my bamboo-based school was also gone. So th there was nothing on ground. So I decided uh, what I can do now. So I designed that portable school for them because okay. it was economical. And I did almost hundred meetings with the donors. Now please sp uh, sponsor this school, and uh, nobody was willing yeah. to invest for them. So, so how then? did it come? Then I uh, I came to know uh, Dr. Sarim Rashid. He raised funds for the school around three million PKR, oh, and then he built the school and handed over me. 
Wow. Wonderful. So now all those children are getting education in the portable school and they and are where getting is this quality school, uh, located it's, it's, in it's on the same place. Wow. Wonderful. It's on the same place in Sabzazar Lahore and we are providing them daily breakfast. SKZ model school, SKZ right? SKZ model school, yeah. Wonderful. And we are providing them daily breakfast in school. Manda yeah. Oh, <laughs> Milk. Cup chai alki yeah. Milk. Yeah. Yeah. And Milk. then uh, we have proper menu for lunch. Wow. Wonderful. And but that is also an incentive for people to come and send their children because at least they can get two times meal there, right? And especially for the poor people out there who are struggling to make their both end meat, right? It's a big incentive. And you know, the interesting thing is when I was not giving them food and all the stuff, they were still coming. Wonderful. And they used to work one hour to right. come to school. Wonderful. But, but people say they don't want to get education. Article 2A, uh, it states that education is compulsory, compulsory and yes. state will provide it, but it's not a thing. And then uh, when I went to different organizations, and please they want to get education help them no they, they, they said they will not uh, get education and they are not interested because f to give them education you have to create a bond with them that's true I have eaten with them in their jogis I, I have uh, you know spent time with them in their difficult time I was with them so that's why they, they started believing me Marshall. and now uh, I'm I have a small container what do, space. What do they call you? Madam teacher, Madam principal? Miss Hibza. <laughs> Miss Hibza. And, and interesting thing is uh, parents are also learning from their children. Wow. Yes. When I when I go to school, That's the parents process. from the Jugis they say, Hello Miss Hibza, how are you? <laughs> so uh, it's it's a change in generations, not exactly. just uh, on a particular child. Exactly. And and very quickly before we wrap it up as well, and obviously you've done a great job, you know, so wonderful, a big round of applause for you and a lot of people out there clapping for you as well. What is the mission of SKZ? Because I've seen that you know you've done Ramadan aid projects. I've seen that you've yes. done projects on climate change, and that too you've been doing it for free for the betterment of the country, for the betterment of the future generation of the country. And uh, how do you feel after doing all of this? And will you continue to do it, or do you think that you will have to put a uh, foot on it, and you might have to stop at some point, and then make it in a way that you know, that it is self-sustainable? Well, if I had to stop, I would have already stopped, okay. <laughs> but I didn't. Uh, so um, after slams, I went to Gilgit Baltistan and I made three schools there. Uh, sure. The same situation was there. So I'm just replicating the model now yes. without any support from the government or any other organization. Yeah, but people are supporting. People started supporting me. So uh, my vision is to provide education to the children and empowered the women in Pakistan. Wonderful. That is how we can change the future of Pakistan. 22.8 million children are out of school in Pakistan. Yeah. This is my target. And how many children do you have in your schools now? I have 800 students and many, many other families, they, they, like Wonderful. you know, five to six families from slums comes daily. That please give uh, admission to our, our children, but we don't have space. Then? So, inshallah, in future, we will uh, make a proper, from container-based school, my plan is to shift to a proper building school, inshallah. And now, you know, there's one more thing which I'm going to offer on behalf of PTU World, and that is that you're more than welcome to bring your children to our program, and we would love yes. to have yes. a conversation yes. with them, and it, it's going to be lovely. So, whenever it's possible sure. for you, thank you very much, Dr. Saiba, for being thank with so us, much. and you're doing something, which obviously Allah is going to yes. pay you more but for that. I think no human yes. can actually compare the kind of effort you've made of course. for the people who themselves weren't able to do for their kids. Yes. So it's a great achievement and yes. uh, we hope and pray that a lot of people out there are willing to donate as well. So if there's anything, you know, you would want to share your email address or phone numbers where people can donate, please go ahead yes. and let us know. Uh, if anyone want to donate or want to visit school or if you need any information regarding SKZ's projects, please contact 0321-4930-492 or you can visit our website yeah. skzfoundation.pk. Or you can come to Sabzazar Lahore, ladies and gentlemen, where yes. the SKZ model yes. school is itself and see for yourself. Yes. And with that, we will say thank you to Ms. Hamza for coming here, Jazakara. inspiring a lot of people out there and especially tending for that segment of the society which is underprivileged and which they can't tend to themselves. So uh, with that, we will wrap up our segment and say Allah Hafiz and goodbye and continue having such kind of conversation in the future too. So until next time, it's a goodbye Allah Hafiz and good morning. Good morning. Have a great day.